many questions prior to this session, so we have to condense them into a few, and hopefully these will balance the majority of what was asked. I'm going to start with the first one. It's from Sam Amog, and Sam says, where is the dividing line between private and public sector in the provision, ownership, and operation of public infrastructure? I'll open the floor. Do you want one of us to answer that, or is that? What, so I'll mean? take it again. Yes, yeah, so it's a question by Sam Amon, and you, anyone can answer it. He says, where is the dividing line between the private and public sector in the provision, ownership, and operation of public infrastructure? Should I come in? You may. We just need some moderation. Um, you know, in, in, in a technology like this, we, we might end up talking over each other. Um, I don't think there is, really is one. I think the critical thing is that the public sector has to make sure that there's quality. Firstly, the, you know, the government would be responsible for raising money from wherever that comes from. It's got to underpin the risk and make sure that the regulatory environment is what it needs to be and that the quality control is there. But after that, it's a choice. These days, it, was, it wasn't always so. Uh, you know, it used to be that stuff was just delivered within the state, or, or maybe there's no state, but you know, where there is a strong state, uh, government might have delivered. But now, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really a, a, a policy choice. Mm. There's loads of options, but you have to make sure. You know, the thing, I would just coming back to that market reform point. People, you know, people sometimes have this view like the private sector has more capacity, so they should, you know, reform the market and let the private sector do it. But it doesn't work like that. When you want to reform a market, you need a lot of capacity. Otherwise, it can be very dangerous. Market reform just means market restructuring, introducing competition. It can be a very good thing. But you need a strong regulation, a strong state, uh, capable procurement capability, design. You need to know what you want. Uh, you know, you can't outsource everything when you're working in the public interest. So when you're dealing with these public private interfaces, you need actually strong state capability in that case as well. And people must never forget that. The worst thing that you wanna see is a privatized monopoly. I can promise you without, without uh, regulation and control and guidance. It's, it's worse than a state monopoly, actually. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question, I think Adrian, you, you can take this one. It's from David Woodop. He says, what is the difference in funding models between private and public funders? When is best to use which model or a combination? Uh, wow, uh, that's a huge question. Um, so the, you know, where you're likely to get public funding being far more viable or feasible is in instances where uncertainty is much, much higher. Uh, despite all the chest beating, the private sector is actually very cowardly when it comes to project funding. Um, where time horizons uh, are, are mismatched, um, you might you know, have a, a time horizon of 20 or 30 years uh, before something gets into uh, you know, cash delivery and a private funder simply wouldn't have the appetite uh, for that type of uh, horizon or timeline. Or you might have a very, very deep uh, J curve uh, where you're going to bleed lots of cash uh, and even if it is an intense short burn, the number is just too big. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you have to do this on a case by case basis, rather than, you know, all of these things are public and all of those things are private. Uh, but uh, the, the, the caveat or the uh, a prescription that we would want to put around for South Africa um, is, uh, is, is two legged. The first is South Africa has very sophisticated financial mm -hmm. market, but relatively unsophisticated impact. So we've got great ability to build a pension fund industry and a, and a very developed and well-regulated 
bond market and Johannesburg Stock Exchange, but it doesn't translate into impact. And so there's a there is a big disconnect between the funding uh, and uh, and the delivery. Uh, and and the other point uh, that I think we need to you know, emphasize is any way you dress it up, the reality is South Africa's fiscus public sector has run out of money um, and is going to have to look to the private sector. So I'm not sure that the question, uh, or if I could put the question, just put a little bit of spin on the question and it would be uh, rather, you know, how does the private sector best fill this role um, uh, in partnering with the public sector? And it cannot for one moment be uh, either or, it has to be both. There is no uh, society that has become successful with a public and private sector at each other's necks. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Miriam, Enoch Ngobo sent through his question and he says, I am currently a supply chain director for the University of KwaZulu-Natal based in Northern KwaZulu-Natal. We are currently embarking on huge infrastructure projects to build new residencies, as well as new buildings for engineering faculties in our Richards Bay campus. So he's got two questions here. The first one is, do you, can you offer advice in terms of procurement strategies for these types of projects? And then the second question is, uh, he says, we are also looking at subcontracting huge amounts of work to local businesses. Do you have any processes to advise on with regards to support for our vision? Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> Should we maybe take it one at a time? In, two, um, in, in, a, in a minute or less. Uh, well, the first thing I can say is that there's been um, a lot of success in the university building projects and uh, residences. And I would suggest that firstly, um, that Enoch have a look at the study that was done and maybe contact Ron Watermayer who wrote the study, who had a great involvement in that and he may be able to advise him. Um, and if he needs that connect, that, that contact, I, he's very easy to find, but if, if he wants that connection, I'd, I'd be happy to provide it. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of good experience in this country right now, specifically around uh, these building projects in universities. That's one of the stellar examples that's given, that's gone well. So there's a lot of, there's probably a lot of opportunity to connect with other people who've been involved in those projects and, and, and Ron himself has, is, has been physically involved. In terms of subcontracting, uh, particularly in, in the uh, desire to uh, promote local production, what I should say is, and, and these things may have progressed, I saw that Mekhleli, uh and Pofu had, was, was in the uh, group, and he may have something to say if he's still here. We worked together years ago. Uh, I think he's signed off now, but maybe he could come in. Uh, yeah, he's still there. Um, we worked together with Sean Phillips uh, years ago when I was at HSRC to look at procurement systems at a municipal level and how to think about uh, uh, you know, procuring local production. And, and I, I, for my sins, uh, about 20 years ago, I was head of the Alex Renewal Project's economic program. And we looked at how, I don't know if this is what his question is, but I, I think it's interesting. <laughs> we, we developed a methodology. Part, part of what we were doing was trying to um, stimulate local producers around the Alex procurement list. We were building homes and all kinds of stuff, or we were supposed to be. And we created a methodology for um, identifying um, how we could find different kinds of local suppliers in that supply chain. And I'm, I wouldn't go, you know, that's a whole presentation on its own, but again, uh, we could make all of that available. And, and some of it actually is on my website as well. Uh, but there, there are definitely methodologies that, that, that could be shared. Mm. I, it's, it's a much longer presentation. You know, when you're a practitioner, then, then you really need to know what you're talking about, so, and how to go about it. I, I hope that's helpful. But good question. I'm so glad that he's thinking about it. Okay. 
Uh, our next question, we've got about eight minutes left. And our next question is from Mpo Makanya. And Mpo says, does the so-called township, township economy have a role to play in the national economic recovery efforts, as well as building future economic resilience? If so, what advocacy is currently in place to start thinking differently in terms of township infrastructure provision? I'm gonna open this up to either of the panelists uh, to answer and then we'll proceed. No, I'm, happy, I'm happy to have a go at this, Miriam, uh, uh, first. My, uh, now I'll declare my interest. Um, my, my wife is the CEO of the Youth Employment Service, um, uh, which is part of a very grand ambition to create uh, a million jobs or more exactly a million work opportunities. Uh, and over the course of the last 18 months or so, um, on their way to establishing these 1 million opportunities, they have uh, created 40,000 uh, jobs. And that includes about 6,000 uh, uh, jobs created under COVID, uh, which means they've built you know, a, a material impact, a key aspect. So that's, that's the free advert for her. A key aspect of the work that she's doing um, is is exactly this. It's in this thing called the township economy, where you know we uh, we need to be very careful because uh, just like there, you know, uh, what is a city economy or you know uh, or a rural economy? They're all different. But uh, you know, rather than try and get too academic about it, perhaps I can point to some of the the practical things that they're doing, and their first pilot uh, project was to put together a hub uh, um, uh, in Tembisa. And that hub then put up uh, tunnels and in the tunnels are uh, hydroponics and aquaponics. And believe it or not, Tembisa starts to become a producer of butter, lettuce, strawberries and tilapia. Um, and uh, Tembisa then establishes itself as an export producer for uh, uh, for the more affluent um, food lovers market. Uh, this is structural, to go back to Vishal's point, you know, this is structural reform. This is changing the innate structure of the economy. And there are uh, infinite things that you can do uh, with these types of initiatives. Uh, you can code from uh, all, uh, uh, all around uh, the economy if you've got access to data. You can do a, a master's program in Stanford University in artificial intelligence uh, in Bushbuck Ridge if you've got access to data. So uh, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine a successful South Africa that hasn't uh, uh, looked after um, the capacity and capability of this critical part uh, of our society. Mm. Okay, thank you. Bishal, if I can just bring you in with the next question, it's from Takir Ahmed, and he says, how can we ensure sustainable business and standardize engineering fees in order to encourage business investment in the coming opportunities? Yeah, I know <clears throat> Takir and I have been having this conversation around uh, standardizing. And, you know, when it comes to that concept, I'm, I'm not... I'm not necessarily for or against it because standardizing suggests that we, you know, we use a broad brush approach into, into adopting a, you know, an approach towards uh, engineering, for example. And I'm not convinced that it, it, it was a big talking point uh, many years. I think the, uh, when I studied the Harvard uh, philosophy on, on business, standardizing was, was the way to go. Uh, I'm not convinced that it applies uh, to us to that extent because we have a very diverse economy, as we've spoken about just now. We've got diverse cultures, we've got different needs, different wants, different expectations. And I think, again, you know, we, had, we, we spoke about having conversations around how do we design infrastructure that fits our culture, that fits our communities, and it might not be exactly the same in all cases. Uh, so, so we've got various types of economies, as we mentioned, the, the city economy, the, the rural economy, and the like. And I think the infrastructure 
but to some extent can be standard for 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 the for the for the purposes of, of purchasing and buying but but the way it comes out to look uh, you know can be very different and and if you look at uh, and that's what brings history and, and culture to our community if you look at the uh, salt plaques university for example it's designed to show the culture of of the area that it is in and i think that's what i'd like to see and it was totally not standard and it's won so many awards uh, you know since uh, since it's been established so I, I would almost defer from, from the concept of standardizing to that extent where we make everything look the same because we are not the same people. And, and if you look at the marvels of the, of the globe, it's, it's the differences that make, that make it different. And, and that's what we seem to appreciate a lot. So, so yeah, I would, I would say to Takir, you know, I understand the standardizing. It perhaps has a cost benefit to it. But when you look at what we value as society, it may not be the... the the best way to go. Mm. Um, okay, we've got time for two quick questions. I'm going to give a minute each to the person answering. So, Miriam, this is a question that came up quite often, and I know we made mention of it during our session now. But Yoshni Patel asks and says, "How do we reduce the barriers to entry for startups in the construction industry?" Do you want to just? A minute, uh, just to just to go over and answer that one. Oh, I'm not sure that I'm equipped to um, answer that because I'm not sure what the barriers are. If they're financial, if it's access to tenders, what I do know is that just. Just to give another Alex example, and I'll I'll, I'll be quick because I'm not sure what the over. I'm not sure that I don't have. I don't know where we are right now in relation to access. But just to say, you know, make a really obvious point. When I was heading the Alex Renewal Project Economic Program many, many years, this is many years ago, um, the construction development program came to my program. It was taken out of the engineering or construction sector. There were different sectors of the project and it was handed over to, to under, under my leadership. And part of the reason for that was that um, that they would advertise tenders just before they were coming out, and it made it impossible to be ready. If you if you weren't if you weren't already trained in how to tender and, and how to um, access those opportunities, then you wouldn't you you definitely would not succeed in in doing it. So we had a whole program for uh, developing suppliers well before uh, projects were advertised. You know, that's 20 years ago. I hope, I hope that's changed. Um, I, I would have thought that, you know, finance education and all the, all the develop, you know, the rating systems and so on should be helpful, but maybe others have views on how they work. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, and then our last question, I'll give this one to you, Adrian. Susiso Kumalo says, how would the Lanseria smart city enable change in the way that we look at smart living, dignity, RDP, et cetera? Can, can you answer that for us, please? I'm not, uh, I'm not intimate with that project, but you know, the idea behind uh, uh, smart cities is that they are sustainable, uh, they're efficient, they provide for uh, Vishal's point, you know, varied living, uh, that they are integrative and inclusive. Um, and <laughs> almost each one of those uh, jargon words that I've dropped in there is the opposite to South Africa's history and legacy. Uh, so it, it, it offers uh, an opportunity to entirely re-engineer, reinvent uh, the way we, uh, we live in cities and as uh, as communities, the fact that it's built uh, around an airport uh, means that there is a, a connection to the region. I've done a lot of work uh, in this area, uh, in particular. You mentioned in the introduction, I'm the author of the Visa Africa Integration Index, which measures the connectedness of countries where connectedness affords the opportunity for win-win outcomes. Uh, and South Africa has uh, steadily. Uh, lost ground uh, in this integration with the region. And so by being designed uh, around uh, a transport infrastructure, I think 
uh, affords another angle or avenue um, uh, uh, for, for, for the economy that is built uh, in that area. Mm. Okay. Well, it's just after seven o'clock, so our time has come to an end, and we've come to the end of this very fruitful discussion. And as always, it's sessions like these that bring about new topics that um, end up being webinars that follow these ones. So please, if you are not connected with us already online, follow SciC on all our social media platforms. If you'd like to be a member of SciC, you can also visit SciC, um, our website, and you can apply online to become a member of SciC on SciC.org.za. SciC so a huge thanks to our panel today, Mr. Vichal Lutchman and Dr. Miriam Altman and Professor Adrian Saville for an outstanding dialogue. I mean, I think with the remaining days in 2020, we've been given a lot um, and empowered through this session and how to maximize the opportunities that the season presents to us. Thank you also to Rufilwe, who is behind the scenes with our Facebook Live and our Zoom platform for tonight, ensuring that we all plug in. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in tonight. And from all of us, we say good night and take care.